in a, a series on the Reformation, so you should be able to see it up there. The five solas. I'm going to have a hard time reading the screens today. Um, but the five solas of the Reformation, the things that kind of weren't really a list that any one of the reformers gave kind of in this, this fashion. But after this movement of different country, different leaders with different focal points, even as wars are going on in different countries, that these things kind of emerged as the five cries of the Reformation or the five distinct things that were being put forward. And it's scripture alone, it's Christ alone, and, and the Latin phrases would be uh, sola scriptura, uh, solus Christus, sola gratia, which we're gonna be talking about today, grace alone, sola fide, uh, and then sola deo, gloria. Is that five? Okay. Um, and then uh, we'll be talking about faith next week and then the glory to God alone. Pete's going to be bringing that in two weeks. Uh, and so these things kind of emerged and I'm a bit excited about it because as I've been able to think about this for the last three weeks, it hit me not at a theological level, but, but this began to resonate with me at a psychological level. That that grace, the more I read, the more I kind of dinked around, the more I did searches, and the more I reflected and prayed, it was the psychological aspects of what grace really is and can do in our lives that, that meant something to me. So um, let's pray this morning, and then we'll jump in, and hopefully I'll be able to articulate this uh, for all of us together. Father, we just um, come before you, and we ask that the time we spend in fellowship would, um, would be fruitful, that the difficulties and the challenges in life with circumstances and or with people, um, the uncertainties that we have, that all of us have, uh, that we would be able to deal with those in a healthy way ourselves and then with each other, that somehow we would find unity as believers, um, certainly this morning, and if we move out into this community during the week, uh, help fuel our love um, and, and, and our ability to witness that the good news wouldn't be just something we hear, but it would be something that our lives give testimony to, that we get to practice res uh, resurrection, that we um, become the invitation that you've given to this world for grace and faith uh, through Christ. And we pray that to your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. Um, I was kind of doing some research on just where the, the population is today in terms of different things, particularly with regard to anxiety. And it was interesting reading that, that all sorts of different studies from every direction kind of come to this 40 million person's level or 18.1% um, of adults uh, in America between 18 and in their late 50s, 18.1% of those adults are suffering from, from some core, uh, kind of a broad anxiety disorder. Just, just living with depression or a, a level of constant anxiety that has a significant impact not only on their mental states or their life that way, but also on their physical health. Um, which was a massive number to me. They say that 3.4% of the US population now suffer, uh, suffer from serious psychological distress, and that's up from 3%. It's an incredible rise. It's kind of jetting up. And you begin to get this sense that the, the world in which we inhabit, and we've talked about this before, that the rate of change, that the uncertainty that's going on um, brings on a certain kind of fear, and that that for all of us, I think we deal with that on a weekly basis or a monthly basis or when certain questions come up uh, as we wrestle with what we're gonna do in life or we talk to our spouse or we make plans for the future, that we all have those moments where we're really concerned or, or deeply troubled or afraid. Um, for some of us, that becomes pervasive enough that, that it, it just hangs with us like a fog and we live in a fear that way. And I think when we're beginning to feel like that, there's a corresponding part to it spiritually, because we're spiritual beings that says, um, who am I? And, and am I secure? Am I good enough? Am I loved or am I even lovable? I was talking 
with my sister-in-law before the service, and we were joking about life and all the different things, and, uh, and she was sharing, you know, something difficult about her life, and I said, oh, I, you know, that's not that bad. Um, at least you're likable. And I kind of said it half in, in jest, and then I was kind of like half going, do I feel likable even? Um, Has life gotten so difficult that all of the running around and trying to touch things, has it even robbed my smile or my ability to to have fun or my ability to see the other person in the moment where I could affirm them or or have a twinkle in my eye about what's going on in their life to be connected? This This is what I'm talking about, is that life can be so difficult that we begin to wonder where we really stand. And that's where Luther comes in. And some of this is going to be recap, but I want to kind of show the first picture of Luther in a, a, a thunderstorm. And we've, we've given some of the timeline of the Reformation as we're going through this series, but we'll recap it. Um, and this is the first kind of big moment in Luther's life where he's walking as a law student and gets caught in this thunderstorm and the anxiety of everything going on around him. The, the inability to control things, the fear that exists in his world, the world that he inhabited in the late 1400s and then moving into the early 1500s was one where at any moment the wrong thing could happen. At any moment, a sneeze or a cough could lead to something else. At any moment, if you're caught in the wrong place with bandits coming or or the risk to your life of other persons. It's just not a very uh, secure world, environment. And in this moment of fear, being out at night and in this, this storm and everything that would be going on, he's not in a car in a storm. Um, he's not dressed the way we would have been in a storm. He doesn't have a flashlight the way we would have had a flashlight in a storm. You're picturing someone in the evening out in the countryside being caught in the thunderstorm without any of the modern things that we would have. And there's a certain tension to that. Just think of um, being playing golf in Scotland where there's no trees and, and you're walking and there's a, there's a, a lightning storm and you're a golfer. It makes sense in my mind. It's like nowhere to go, right? Or think of the baptism this past summer for Antioch um, when Kip was asking you to get into the water during during an electrical storm. Um, But so Luther comes with this anxiety and he cries out to St. Anne, which out of his Catholic faith was going to the patron saint and really promising in this moment, "If, if, if I'm delivered, then, then I will become a monk, which is another way of saying, I'll serve you, God, right? And some of you might have that moment of being in the middle of a calculus test where you cry out to God and you're like, God, if you could just save me here, I'll, I'll do anything. And then anything quickly just dissipates after you're done with the test, right? But, but that moment of, of crying out to God. So he becomes a monk and he goes into the monastery. And the next picture um, is Luther the monk. And the anxiety of Luther the monk doesn't necessarily go away, it deepens. Uh, it deepens because in this monastery, he's focused on himself and he begins to, to, to come face to face with the reality that he cannot make himself good enough, that he can, he's not worthy, that every time he tries to confess sin, which is a way of washing or cleansing or, or trying to step to the other side of a line that says, now I've reached a point where, where there's nothing bad, there's nothing messy hanging around me that I can now look to God with a clean or a pure heart. Every time he tried to step across that line, he would realize the, the line just got moved. And so he would go to confession all the time. And in one of his biographies, uh, it says this, that, um, that he had this tender conscience and that before he had hardly discovered his sin, he, d- he would endeavor to expiate it by the severest mortification. So not just confessing, but also whipping himself and, and doing things to punish the bad parts of him, to try and make them go away, to, to, to say self-recriminatingly, I hate this part of me. And I wish I could kill it or push it out. So Luther says, I tortured myself almost to death. 
There's a literal aspect to that. In order to procure peace with God for my troubled heart and agitated conscience. But surrounded with thick darkness, I found peace nowhere. I want to read that last sentence again. Luther's words, in order to procure peace with God for my troubled heart and agitated uh, conscience, but surrounded only with thick darkness, I found peace nowhere. We can over-spiritualize the word peace. And I think here we need to take it back to its, its root simplicity, um, peace of mind, that you can take a breath, that you look at another human being and feel like we're okay, that you think of your future and you think um, it's okay, that you look at God and, and even though you know you're not perfect, that you, you again go, it's okay, that there's a relationship here, that there's a place I can stand here, that even though I have, I have aspects about me that I don't like, I'm not constantly trying to battle with them to try and step outside of my own skin so that then and only then I can have peace. Um, Luther is saying that, that that process or program that he was involved with would not work. He never actually came to a place where he was okay with himself, okay in his relationship with God, okay with who he was in the world. And so Johann von Stippitz, um, Staupitz, Stippitz, um, uh, potato, potato, uh, this is his confessor, and he finally had had enough with Luther, and he sent Luther to be an academic and to get a degree, which is the next picture of Luther no longer as a monk, but that's, that's Johann uh, von Staupitz. That's his confessor. This is who Luther was going to all the time, um, confessing his sins and trying to cleanse or purify himself. He sends Luther to go study and thinks maybe that'll occupy his mind because he's too self-focused at this point. There's no end to the pit that Luther's in. So the next picture is Luther, the academic, and as Luther goes and does his studies, uh, he moves forward in those and is conferred with a doctorate in 1512. And as he's doing this, interesting things happen that the, the development of the, the Greek New Testament in and around Luther's area, in other words, the ability or access that Luther begins to have as a professor to be able to interact with the text of Scripture to interact with it in a different way than the Latin, to begin to think about what does this look like even uh, in German, which later on in the early uh, 1520s, he would actually undertake, uh, we'll talk about that next week, translating the Bible into the vernacular or into the German of the day. But as he's doing this, along with um, uh, Johann von Staupitz's words, he begins to wrestle with grace. Staupitz said this to him, um, Luther Look at the wounds of Jesus Christ, to the blood that he has shed for you. It is there that the grace of God will appear to you. Look at the wounds of Jesus Christ, to the blood that he has shed for you. It is there that the grace of God will appear to you. Christ alone, grace alone, will be sufficient for you. So Luther goes forward, and now we've got Luther the academic, um, and I can't remember if there's another picture of, uh, there's a picture of a book. So Luther, as the academic, begins to fall in love with the book Galatians. Now, the book of Galatians, he'll lecture on it for a whole semester in 1519. Remember, the year of the Reformation uh, is 1517. That's why we just celebrated the 500th anniversary. 1517 is when this kind of begins for Luther. Uh, 1519, the same year that he begins to run into trouble with being excommunicated. He is lecturing to his students about Galatians. He'll return to it again in 1523. And remarkably, the book of Galatians, which consists of only six short chapters, that his commentary on it, Luther's, fills 733 oct octavo pages in the Weidman edition of his works. He wrote the whole thing in Latin. Um, let me say it again, 733 pages in the edition of his complete works. It's fascinating. Um, as he kept coming to Galatians, he would, he would later say uh, towards the end of his life, 
about Galatians that the epistle to the Galatians is my epistle. To it, I am, as it were, in wedlock. It is my Catherine. Luther's wife was Katharina von Bora. Um, this is what Luther is saying. To it, I am, as it were, in wedlock. It is my Catherine. It is my wife. Um, this book became everything for Luther and ultimately shaped a lot of the Reformation, not only through Luther's writings on it, but as other people interacted with the message in Galatians as well. And so in Galatians, without jumping into the whole of the book this morning, I want to talk about just two passages, Luther's comments on them, uh, and then move briefly into Titus before we kind of bring it back and try and apply it. But so Galatians, you remember, is when Paul is writing um, to all of the churches of Galatia. It's the churches that in his first missionary journey, he had brought the gospel of grace to. And he brings this gospel that you don't have to become a Jew. You don't have to do the works. You don't have to engage in ceremonial religious things. You don't have to be circumcised if you're a male. You don't have to anything. You come to Christ by faith, and it's the grace alone, not your works, not your observances, that's going to make you justified, that's going to make you established, that's going to make you worthy, right? This is what he brought to them, and, and then some agitators, he calls them, began traveling and kind of retracing his foot, uh, footsteps. And imagine how frustrated you'd be going to these places at, at the risk of your life, being threatened, being imprisoned. You're, you're doing this and ministering to these people and you get these fledgling congregations going. And now you have people that are gonna go to those cities and not preach, not do what Paul was doing, not put their lives at risk. They're gonna go only to those fledgling congregations and say, oh, no, 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 you have to do more. You're not good enough the way you are. God's not gonna accept you as, as it is right now, here's the list, here's the prescriptions, here's the law that you need to fulfill in order to be right with God, to be in tight with God. And Paul hears about this, and just imagine his frustration. Um, I've thought about my kids. If someone got a hold of them and started telling them bad theology, and doing it at such a persuasive level that it messed up their thinking. Like how protective would I be? And this is Paul's feelings. And so he writes this and he's talking about who has cut in on you? Who has interrupted your race, the race that you were running? Who has bewitched you, you Galatians, that you would believe this, this new kind of thing or teaching, this legalism rather than the gospel I brought you? And he comes to the end of chapter two and he uh, summarizes it this way. And so the end of chapter two, I'll begin reading in verse 19, and then we'll carry through. I think we have some of it on the screen. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. In other words, if there was any way to find sure footing where I could say, um, I'm it, I'm established, I'm undergirded, I'm worthy, I'm likable, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a hero, I'm someone that, that ought to be reputed amongst whatever, uh, I, I don't have to have anxiety anymore because I know that I'm right with God. I don't have to live in fear anymore of my own problem spots because I've got this good part and that good part in me is enough. There's no place we can go, nothing within us that we can reach for where we don't also need the grace of God to fully establish us. And so this is what Paul says, I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness, rightness with God could be gained through the law, then Christ died for nothing. The fact that I have need, the fact that I go through life and, and have my ups and downs and my doubts and my fears and my anxieties, 
the fact that I walk through the valley of the shadow of death and know that I am not sufficient for myself, the fact that I have need is why Jesus Christ came and died. If we didn't have need, then he would not have died. If some of us didn't have need, then he would have only died for some, yet he died for all. And so this is what Paul talks about. This is what Luther grabs hold of. So Luther says this, to be convinced in our hearts, I can't read it, um, to be convinced in our hearts that we have forgiveness of sins and peace with God by grace alone is the hardest thing. This is from his commentary on Galatians. To be convinced in our hearts that we have forgiveness of sins and peace with God by grace alone is the hardest thing. We tend to start with grace. The preacher told me if I do this, then I'm gonna be right with God. If I reach out in prayer to Jesus, I'll be right with God. If I become a Christian, I'll be right with God. We start there. And a year later, two years later, five years later, when we begin to have the the secrets, when we begin to have the list of, of, of ways we've messed up that Christians aren't supposed to mess up, when we begin to realize that I can project onto a group that I'm better than them at certain things, when I can begin to at least go, I'm a good Christian according to this standard, or in comparison to those people, we begin to more and more rest in that righteousness that, hey, I'm at least better than average, right? And the crazy thing is 80% of people think they're better than the average, right? And I'm at least better than the average, so that, that ought to be good enough, but it's actually not good enough because we know we go to bed at night and sometimes we don't want to talk to God. And we know we go to bed at night and we don't really take the environmental stressors and the thunderstorms and the finances and bring those to God and say, God, without your grace, there's no way I'm going to be able to stand here regardless of circumstances. Our own sense of inferiority and self-recrimination, when we look at ourselves in the mirror and we realize we're not the person we project on Instagram or Facebook or even in our dealings at work and, and in the community, that we, we realize no matter how hard we've tried to make our best day every day, that that's just not us. And, and no matter how much we want to be established there, and we try to justify ourselves by being ahead of the pack, that will never work. We somehow have to grab hold of the grace of God, and it's hard to have grace alone. To be convinced in our hearts that we have forgiveness of sins, that we are justified by grace with God, and that we do have, therefore, peace with God, that is the hardest thing. Now, someone might say, well, is grace you're making it sound like grace is something that extends through time rather than saving grace, Jesus on the cross. Absolutely. I'm not washed in it day one. I live in it day one through N. Anybody take calculus in college? You know what N is then, right? It's, it's just some letter. I could never figure out what number it was. Um, if you really want to know one of my deepest secrets. I took four semesters of, of college calculus in the engineering department of Clemson University, and they were four credit units each. Um, most people have never had a class that's four credit units. You know, you, you usually have a three credit unit class. Um, and I, it broke my brain, and I can't, I actually can't do simple math anymore. I hide it from people. Um, but I don't have that language anymore, simple math. It, it doesn't exist. I have to use a calculator for everything. Um, so if I ask you to do some multiplication because we're somewhere and I need to figure out the bill, I'm not testing you. Um, I'm, covering, uh, I'm covering something in me. Um, next verse, Galatians 1.6 on the screen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live 
in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. We live in grace. We exist in Christ. His righteousness cloaks us. The new reality we have is not that we're wound up so perfect at our baptism that we just go and impress everybody from that day forward. The beauty is from that moment forward, we walk as ones established regardless of our behavior or the mess that hangs around us or our own self-recriminating thoughts that Jesus' righteousness covers us like a cloak that we were in some sense tucked up into that that we are in Christ. And so we live not only by faith as we walk forward, but we live in grace. Uh, Another Luther quote um, that I can't read. Um, The sin underneath, is that the right one? The sin underneath all our sins is to trust the lie of the serpent that we cannot trust the love and grace of Christ and therefore must take matters into our own hands. The sin underneath all our sins is to trust the lie of the serpent that we cannot trust the love and grace of Christ, and therefore we must take matters into our own hands. I I know that there's a lot of us here today that our spiritual vitality and passion for the things of God today is not what it was five years ago or 10 years ago or when we became a Christian. And that in that lack of vitality and energy, we, like a drowning person, are trying to reach for some things that will make us feel secure, that will make us feel good enough, that'll make us feel worthy, that'll make us feel like we don't have to hate ourselves self-hatred, recrimination, that we fall out of the habit of staying close to God in prayer, the one who wants to forgive our sins, if we would but confess them, says, says uh, John in his letter, that we can come boldly before the throne of grace and that there are mercies new every morning and that we, we are reminded again by our Father who is love. God is not marked by his judgment. We live as Christians as if God is judgment. And the Bible teaches us the opposite, that God is love. And whatever discipline comes out of love as a parent for a child is always purposeful, aimed and designed by that love for good things. God is love. And when we spend time around God, the people of God, the things of God, we come back and freshen that up, we will see that. And we will, we will be reminded that grace alone is the only place where we can come and look at life and say, even if it all goes wrong, even if it's the worst, I'm still okay. God, will you still be with me? Yes, then I'm okay. I'll walk whatever road you have. And even when I look and find ugly things in myself and I go, I wish I was more likable. I wish I was more like this person with this personality trait. Or I wish I was more like that person that that just seems to always get that right. And we, we begin to have those thoughts. God says, don't do that. I made you. I've got a plan for you. I know what I'm calling you to. You walk that by faith. Together with me, we are co-laborers with God. You are a son or a daughter of God. I don't want you to be somebody else. Be you, right? This is what we're saying here, that the sin underneath our sin is to trust the lie of the serpent that somehow we have to add something to the love and the grace of Christ, that it isn't grace alone. It's grace plus whatever we're grabbing this week to try and work it out, to try and fix ourselves. Um, you've heard me say it before. I've become pretty fond of it. I, I have a lot of things that, a lot of bad theology that was, was taught to me along with a lot of good theology when I was in seminary and, and growing up with my mentors. And I think I, I'm fully at the point of wanting to admit that one of the bad theological things that we did over the last 50 years, maybe longer, is we created this idea of marriage as this finish line that, that you're incomplete unless you're there. And we alienated generations of singles. That something was wrong if you weren't yet married. 
Because we would take a verse in Genesis that's there that says it's not good for man to be alone, which means more than just marriage. It also means fellowship and community. But we would take that verse and, and we built our whole theology around that. And we never came over here and grappled with the fact that Jesus was single and that Paul commended singleness as being better than marriage in terms of our ability to walk with and serve God. And, and therefore, we have these things that, in this instance, tyrannize Christians. Singles have been tyrannized in religious spaces because of that inadequacy. Mental health, we don't know how to talk about it in the church, yet it exists at a pretty strong level. Um, and because we don't talk about it, people with mental health issues feel inadequate. They're not enough. They're not sufficient. There's something about themselves they have to hide. Why? I mean, we could go on, people with addictive behaviors, people that just have mess that hangs around them. And what we've done is we've so overpromised people that when you come to Jesus, that you're going to be fixed, that somehow we don't have language for the fact that God loves us without our being fixed. And that there will come a time when I die and when I leave this earth and I will not yet be fixed. I live in an age of being sanctified. I'm not glorified and I will never be glorified on this earth. I will never stop across, step across that line. I will never be fully justified. I will never be worthy in myself. I won't be glorified. And if that's true, if I'm always going to be messy, and if grace always has to work in my mess, why are we so quick to create a culture that makes people feel when they're messy that somehow they have to hide it because if their mess comes out, it's, it's almost going to somehow say that they're not a Christian or that they weren't saved or that it didn't take whatever that thing was that was supposed to take and then fix everything in their life? We've created cultures that tyrannize people. That's the law. Expectations that aren't realistic. Demands that God himself doesn't even have. Ways of judging people that further establish that we're on the right side of the line and they're on the wrong side of the line. And Jesus would look at that and say, of course I know the law. But why are you using the, the law as a weapon against somebody that I love? I'm here to seek and to save the lost. I'm here to die for the sins of the world. I'm here so that in my grace, people can know life and have life to the full. To not be fully fixed, but to be fully alive and fully human and in our messiness to fully know the love of God. That one article that I read, um, it... Uh, it was interesting, I had never read that, the one that said that, that mental health had risen from 3% to 3.4%, which was a massive rise uh, in depression and severe anxiety in this country. And the article said and argued that it was, that it was most likely directly a, res a result of the recession of, of uh, 2007 and 2008. That we've never really grappled with it as a society at a deep psychological level, but the trauma that people endured with businesses, with homes, with losing those things, and the fact that the myth of this American dream that things are gonna just get better and better and better, and that if I just do the right things, I'm on that um, conveyor belt, that my life will just get better and better and better. I'll have stability, I'll have a career, I, I don't have to worry about it, and I'll always have enough. That myth, in, in some ways, was fully shattered in 2007, 2008. And that people are now living for the first time in their lives with the reality that there is an uncertainty to things, that, that there's fear about the lightning storms, that there's an anxiety that I don't know how to fully put my hand on or touch all the things in my life, whether it be the things outside of the home or even the things inside the home. And I can't just trust that I grew up in America, was raised by good people, and so somehow it has to work out. We now know it doesn't have to. And we're, we're wondering where stability comes from. 
And Luther comes to us as someone that wrestled with those same things, the environmental anxiety, the spiritual, psychological anxiety. And so I, I wrote this down because I, I didn't think I'd be able to say it otherwise. But sola gratia, grace alone, is about the revolutionary biblical Jesus birth notion that our sense of benevolence, our sense of goodness, comes from someone with a bigger sense of benevolence. That our sense of mercy, like what we have in ourselves, limited as it is, it derives from someone with more mercy than us. That our sense of worthiness now can be anchored for good in someone who is worthy. That we are justified through Christ, viewed as sons and daughters of God in the family, loved despite any behavioral issues, inadequacies, messy tags that hang around us or give us feelings of self-recrimination. We don't struggle for grace. We don't earn grace. We simply receive it. First John says this, that there is no fear in love, um, but perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. And the one who fears is not made perfect in love. Let's just stop right there. We've heard this so many times that we're not trained to apply it to our life. I want you in your mind right now to say, I, and then say your name. I can. Do it in your mind. Today, struggle with fear. I am afraid. I don't fully have within me what I need to secure peace. First John says there's no fear in love, brother or sister. That fear, when we come into love, there's no fear in that. Perfect love, the perfect love of God will drive out fear. Grace that is unearned, that comes into your life and is complete that that grace will drive out fear because God is not wanting to punish you. God sent Jesus to die so that instead of the business of punishment, he could be about the business of redemption and reconciliation. That God is searching for you if you are lost and if you are found in one of the sheep here, then God is caring for you like a good shepherd. When, when, when David wrote Psalm 23, he was writing about God the Father. Jesus borrows that imagery for God the Son. But God the Father, too, is a shepherd who cares and loves and nurtures his sheep. That the one who fears is not made perfect in love. That we're not going to, we're not going to get there through fear. And ultimately, this love that comes is going to drive our love. So the love that is going to breathe life into the world, the love that is going to bring spring uh, and flowers, like, like when Aslan walked through Narnia and winter was chased away as at his heels, flowers are springing up and uh, birds begin to sing. As we walk through this world and love people and that we're known to be Jesus' disciples when we do it, that that love is going to first and only come when we understand and experience the fullness of the love of God for us. That grace alone, it's scary, it's awkward. I don't know how to take it in. I'd rather punish myself. I'd rather tell God that I'm never gonna do that thing again. I'd rather be miserable all day because then I feel like I've paid for it. I'd rather, I'd rather than just accept grace. It's awkward. We love to sing about how amazing grace is, but it's awkward. When we accept it, we're naked. Yet, it's beautiful. And I can begin to start loving myself again. And I can begin to start trusting again. And I, be I can begin to start loving you even in your messiness. Because grace begets grace and love begets love. There was a, um, a writer that I read, um, a woman turned Lutheran, uh, that grew up in a fundamentalist family and was tyrannized by depression, um, her own bouts of depression. And she found something beautiful in Luther. At the end, she says this, I, I give thanks for all 
that the Protestant Reformation, by the way, she wrote this years ago, I give thanks for all that the Protestant Reformation brought about, and I give thanks for the good story that, that Christ lived through the life of an imperfect, freed saint and sinner named Martin Luther. A um, lot been going on about was Luther a good guy or a bad guy? It's a wrong question. All of us who have been redeemed by Christ are saints and sinners. And this is what she wrote. Surely there is a lesson here for Christian witness today. We shouldn't share Jesus by giving people lists of rules or edicts to follow. When the first thing people hear from us is how they'll never, ever measure up. Don't they already know that? I mean, New Year's resolutions, anyone? And how righteous we are. We just lay the burden of legalism on them all over again. But when we lead with story, listening to theirs and sharing our own, a door opens to share not just a list of truths, but the experience of truth. Where can we identify our own struggle of feeling inadequate to our responsibilities as humans? Where can we speak of our own staggering failures? Where can we identify the reality of our common human brokenness in popular culture today? And how can we speak of the good news of the weight of expectation, requirement, and consequent failure being forever lifted from our chest. We can speak of it through our stories and through the stories of Christians throughout history. Brennan Manning says this, that suffering, failure, loneliness, sorrow, discouragement, and death will be part of your journey. Suffering, failure, loneliness, sorrow, discouragement, and death will be part of your journey. But the kingdom of God will conquer all these horrors. No evil can resist grace forever. So as we go to take communion, are we going back? Is there something up front? I can't see it. As we come to take communion, I just would remind us of Johann von Staupitz's words to Luther in his anxiety, in his self-recrimination, Staupitz, as his confessor said, look at the wounds of Jesus Christ. To the blood that he has shed for you, it is there, only there, that the grace of God will appear to you. Grace that is complete, grace that is sufficient, for it is grace alone that, that saves us and sustains us. Father, we commit this morning to you Remind us of your love for us. Remind us of, of what has happened through the blood poured out on the cross through Jesus Christ. Remind us right now that we are in your family and we are with family today. That the person on our left, the person on our right is no common individual. They are a son or a daughter of the Most High. They are our brother, our sister. They are someone we are to encourage and receive encouragement from. Let this environment be an environment of grace. Let us find grace as we come. In Christ's name, amen.